Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. My name is Jim Collins. I work with the North Dakota Department of Health in the Division of Water Quality. Um, Laura introduced me as a water liaison, watershed liaison. People are like, what is that? Uh, so I'll describe a little bit about, I do uh, TMDLs. I write TMDLs, total maximum daily loads, which for those who are unfamiliar with that, it's basically a prescription for a lake, river, or stream on how much pollution can hold and still function. Uh, I also do non-point source information education, which is how I got into the think water uh, end of it. And then I also work with conservation districts and do ambient water quality monitoring. So my days are full of good stuff. Uh, and then I get to travel to DC to find more snow. And I get to go back home because we've got a winter storm warning right now, so back in Bismarck. Uh, but my title of my talk today is the Mac Attack, and or teaching an old dog a new trick, or better trick. As an agency person, we have lots of programs out there, so what I want to do is give you a little background of uh, what we do, and one aspect of that. And I bring you greetings from the great state of North Dakota, uh, where we have some wonderful prairie thunderstorms. We've got lakes. We do have lakes in North Dakota, not as many as Minnesota or Wisconsin. <laughs> we have the Badlands that shaped a president's life, Theodore Roosevelt. And then the bottom slide, uh, bottom right, is one of the, some of the prettiest skies you'll ever see, uh, which I noticed in D.C. I tried looking out last night, and there isn't a whole lot of sky to see in D.C. But that's my perspective. Another perspective is this, that North Dakota is located out on this flat rectangle out in the middle of the country past the Hudson River and Washington, D.C., and we're just west of Chicago, east of the Pacific Ocean, and depending on the day, we could be in Canada or we might not be. <laughs> and you have no idea how many times we've been asked, uh, are you in Canada? No, no. We would say A there. Okay, so that's one perception. Another perception I'd like to get to is one of the things I handed out. I asked if I could, I'm an old, I'm a teacher by trade and an environmental scientist by accident. So one of the things I wanted to do is give you, some of you, an idea on perspective. When you see this slide, how many see one face? Raise of hands. Okay, how many see two faces? Okay, I'm one of the few that see two. I can't see the one. There's one face here that's leaning in to this face here. So I can see those two, but I can't see the, I can't see the one face very well. So that's my perspective. We're both looking at the same picture, but we have different perspectives. Now, for those of you that I handed a couple sheets of paper to, take the sheets, turn them over, just one, a, just one, and turn to your partner that I designated for you, and each of you grab an end of the paper. Okay? So one's looking at it from one direction, one's looking at it from another direction. And explain to the person what you see. And the picture they're looking at, I'll hold it up in case the camera can see it. Okay, now flip it around. Okay. Now, depending on which picture you looked at first, some of you had this one with the cute puppy dog with a bone, and you flip it around, and it's an old Scottish dude. Okay. Now that's a perspective, two different perspectives on a really it's the same issue, but two really different perspectives. Old man, puppy dog. Now take the other picture and look at it. Same way. Each of you take a hold of the paper and take a look. Then flip it around. And what you have are two different faces. So we have a less complicated issue, but again, two, two different perspectives. 
And that's where systems, systems thinking comes in. It helps you figure out what model, mental models you face, perceived reality, factual reality, what can be done to adjust those mental models, and then how can we tune in our information to adjust the mental models. I'm going to speak to this from the conservation field, and since I've got a USDA guy here, I love this. Okay? This quote is from Hugh Hammond Bennett, the father of the conservation movement, um, in 1928. The writer, after 24 years spent in studying the soils of the United States, is of the opinion that soil erosion is the biggest problem confronting the farmers of the nation over a tremendous part of its agricultural lands. 1928. 90 years later, I ask, are we passing? These are three different pictures. Two are of the same storm. This is of a storm, dust storm in eastern North Dakota in the fall of 2017. The picture on the right is my view of that same storm from my semi as I'm hauling corn uh, for my in-laws. I help out on the family farm. Uh, same storm, I'm 60 miles away from that picture that was taken on top. The following picture, just so you know it doesn't only happen in North Dakota, that's of a dust storm in Texas. 90 years later, we're still talking the same problems. So when I'm thinking about systems thinking, one of the questions I'm starting to ask, and Brenda brought it up uh, the other night is, you know, some people finally, we, we really need to talk the facts and that we might not be doing good. We need to do better. So systems thinking, I'm thinking, there must be a better way to do our job. Now, typically, the environmental scientist in me, if I perceive there's a problem or a lack of caring or action, what we do is perform factual regurgitation. Parts per million, milligrams per liter, pounds of dust in the air. To back us up, then we have charts and graphs. And if we really want to strike home the point, we add it colors. And if you look over here, that's what I have in that chart. That's actually a chart I present, but it's only a chart I present to say, this is really stupid. Uh, there's a better way of interpreting those results. Because the normal person looks at it and goes, okay, looks great. So I think it's imperative we change the way we think about affecting environmental awareness and knowledge. We have to change our way of thinking. And as Derek said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. We must evolve, kind of like the stick man. This is one of my favorite drawings. I think from the same person that Derek had one. I pretty much draw like that as well. So we have to involve our mental models. Uh, what I did is I looked at the program I deal with, water quality, uh, watersheds, that sort of thing. How do I improve water quality? By taking a look at our stakeholders, from farmers and ranchers down to municipalities. Then I look at the programs that I've been offering over the years. And I started to evaluate those programs using the mental model picture and whether or not the mental model I was hoping to get, which was increased awareness and knowledge about water quality, was actually happening. The other thing I did was identify some of the roadblocks. And I think that's one of the things that has been left out are the roadblocks. We throw out the knowledge, we throw out the information, but we forget that maybe this person doesn't like this or has a different picture. So we have to identify that. And what I'm going to talk specifically about today is something called the Outdoor Eco-Ed Center, a concept that we've started in North Dakota many years ago with a program, but now we're trying to centralize it into some well-built uh, outdoor centers. And this is what one looks like. A little congested, kind of like a mental model map with lots of lines, uh, but we have five different stations. We have soils at the top up here, wetlands, forestry, watersheds, and prairie or rangeland. 
those concepts that go into promoting good water quality. Notice I'm not talking about water quality necessarily in any one of those, but if I'm talking soil health and you're doing soil health and improving soil health, I get better water. So I don't need to worry about the water quality component in that. Same thing with wetlands, rangeland, and forestry. This is what one looks like up close and personal. We've got a gazebo for a main classroom. We have some shelters that are just four-sided, very simple. Something to give the kids shade, the presenter shade. If they need to block the wind, a $2 type tarp works really good. Uh, over here is another part. We've got rangeland planter boxes so that they don't get mowed. That's very crucial if you're building a site because the first thing that the school people want to do is, we need to mow that lot. It looks a little messy. Well, they run over plants. Um, and then we get publications. Take it outside. You just might learn something. Like Derek had said and others, tactile use, such as, one, as the soil station. This is a Paul DeBoer, a conservationist, district conservationist in the central part of our state demonstrating soils to kids, but he doesn't just demonstrate, they get to touch and feel. They get to run that soil through their hands. Is it slippery? Is it sticky? Does it lump up when you squeeze it? If you drop acid on it, does it fizz? All things that they can experience at an outdoor eco-ed center. And so I took it a step further and I thought, well, let's map this sucker. We've mapped a little bit, so now we're going to activate and check it. And, I want, and the reason I did that is to evaluate, and in this case specifically, my portion of it. And this was what the map would look like of the entire outdoor eco-ed center. But then I backed into the watershed model. Um, it's, uh, and the reason I did it is because I've been doing this presentation a long time, about 24 years, to sixth graders which really made me happy that our lead off speaker talked about dinosaur pee because I do the same thing and I'm like not the only one. So what I did was just did a very simple map for now. Uh, my other ones look a little messier than this. But we've mapped the activity, what kind of outcome we've got as far as the outdoor education center what points I want to go through in terms of the watershed model. Uh, what is a watershed? Uh, we were talking about this last night and someone said, well, I don't really know how to describe a watershed. I said, well, it's simple. It's an area of land that drains to a common point. Well, I don't really get that. It's a bathtub. If you want a third grader or a sixth grader to understand what you're talking about, a watershed, they've all been in a bathtub, hopefully, mm -hmm. or a shower. But all the water that falls on the inside edges of the tub, that's a mini watershed. It goes down to the drain. So once they start making that connection that they're going to be part of a watershed, I'm hoping we're changing some attitudes. But the check on my watershed model are, is, are they do they have the ability to divine a watershed? Maybe know which ones they're in. Can they define point source and non-point source pollution easily? And then finally, can they explain some of the effects of pollution? So I'm hoping as I go through my entire program and not only map it out with the systems thinking map, but also mapping out all the activities that I do, I'll have a little, lot better focus and maybe start to change that environmental awareness. Because I see the advantages of the MAC is it helps you visualize and focus your message. It provides that checks and feedback. Yes, you need to know if you're doing a crappy job and change it so you do a really good job. Are we providing the right food for the mental model? If we're just throwing out facts, is that the right food? I still say we're not. After 90 years, and I think we've mentioned this is, man, you bang your head against the wall for 90 years, something's got to change. You're going to have a heck of a headache. And the other advantage I see to this is it allows for transition. I'm not going to be in my position forever, so hopefully somebody coming in can then take a look at my maps, my max, and say, this is where this guy was going. 
man, he screwed up. Or, hey, this is exactly where we need to be. This is the path we need to stay on. So it allows for that transition in staff. And that's something we all hope we don't have, but we do end up with a lot of it. And finally, I just leave you with the perspective never changes if you never step outside the door. You need to step out, adventure out, take a step on the uncomfortable side so that you can change your perspective and others. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to come today and show you a North Dakota perspective. And this is a lovely double rainbow I was able to catch when I was during harvest. I like harvest time. It's a great time of year in North Dakota. So thank you very much. Thank you.